Welcome to the second workshop on the Freudian unconscious. In this second workshop, we're going to be covering three papers still from the 1890s at the origin of Freud's career. That is Obsessions and Phobias from 1895, Heredity and the Etiology of Neuroses from about the same time, and Sexuality and the Etiology of, of Neuroses from 1898. Um, over the course of these three papers, we're basically still focused on the origin of Freud's identification of the neuroses. Um, and we get a little bit closer to understanding the origin of the method, which Freud uses to identify the cause of the neuroses. So let's dive into the first paper. The first paper titled Obsessions and Phobias. Um, Basically, there's a common theme here that we can follow from the, the, the first papers we covered, which is basically that Freud's saying that if we really pay attention to obsessions and phobias, that is people becoming obsessed with certain ideas and people scared of certain events or ideas, um, that these cannot be accounted for purely on physical or neurological mechanisms, um, which is what the doctors of his time had ascribed most of the obsessions and phobias to. And I mean, I think that contemporary treatment would default to these, obs obs uh, default to these explanations in many cases, although not, not to the same extent probably that Freud was dealing with in the 19th century. Um, and in his disagreement with this notion that that obsessions and phobias could be primarily accounted for from physiological or neurological mechanisms, he again puts emphasis on, on the level of, of trauma and the level, the level of emotional, emotional disturbance that goes on in a subject's life. Now, the interesting notion that he makes when it comes to obsessions and what he calls true obsessions is that a subject will struggle with a certain idea forcing itself onto the subject. And this forcing upon the subject will force the subject to repeat the idea over and over and over again. But the most interesting dimension of Freud's observation is that he claims that when it comes to an obsession, usually the emotional state is primary and the idea that the subject is obsessed about is secondary. I think that this is such an important um, reflective uh, distinction to pay attention to, because if you pay if you pay attention, if you're someone who frequently becomes obsessed with different ideas, Freud's point is that this moving from obsessive idea to obsessive idea, like for me, for example, there have been many different times in my life where I've been obsessed with different ideas. What Freud's saying is that the emotional state is primary and that that emotional state doesn't change. It's merely that there's some emotional disturbance in the subject, which leads to, it's kind of like the obsessional idea is contingent. The obsessional idea, it could have been something else and it can likely shift, it can likely change. It's kind of like the emotional constant is the frame within which the idea, the obsessional idea is being sort of, you know, the, the frame within which the idea forces itself, that, you know, the contingent idea forces itself on the subject. Um, and he calls this whole process where an emotional state persists indefinitely and then obsessional ideas come and go as through this idea of substitution that whatever idea a subject is obsessed with, it's not really the cause of the subject's problem. Um, it's more that there's been a process of substitution where the obsessive idea is blocking access to something disturbing, something emotionally traumatic. Um, and it doesn't yet talk about the method of psychoanalysis to get to this emotional disturbance, but we'll save that for the next paper. At the moment, it's, it's, it's only important to focus on this idea of the process of substitution. Um, 
one of the most interesting things he says about this process of substitution is that it comes about, you know, vis-a-vis -vis this emotional disturbance as it relates to something incompatible in the subject. Um, not yet talking about sexuality, we'll leave that to the next paper. But this notion of incompatibility, I think, is extremely important and even central. Um, if you want to use a different term, which is more frequently used in contemporary philosophy, I think it would be the notion of contradiction. So basically, what is emotionally disturbing, Freud's identifying, is something of an incompatibility or something of a contradiction, which the subject cannot deal with. Uh, and so there's a process of substitution where there's a, an idea or a series of ideas which the subject will become obsessed with, which in reality are blocking the subject from confronting this incompatibility, he called it, or we could say contradiction. Now, once this, this whole process is important to understand because once this process of substitution has occurred, Freud claims it is impossible to reach the emotional state causing the symptom. Basically, the obsessional idea here is a symptom. And it's impossible to reach it once this process of substitution has happened and has occurred on many different levels. It might even be worthwhile to conceptualize this as a type of archaeology of archaeology of the subject. So it's kind of like once the obsessional idea has repeated itself many, many times over, kind of like there's so many layers of, of soil and ground on top of the emotional disturbance itself that you can't see it, you can't reach it, and the subject can't speak it. Um, so it might actually be helpful to think about the parts of yourself that you struggle to speak is, is, is what, I, what I would think here, because the parts of yourself that are hard to speak are probably this emotional incompatibility, this emotional contradiction, which has gotten buried over with ideas which are taking you further away from that disturbance. Now, he moves then from obsessions, which you could say as the classical obsessional neurotic, and in later analyses of later papers, we'll see that that's associated more with masculinity and men. But he also talks, I mean, in all these papers, he's dealing with a bifurcation, and that is between the obsessional neurotic and the hysterical neurotic. As we mentioned last time, the hysterical neurotic is more often than not female, feminine, although it's not strictly tied to the genders. So the difference he makes in the obsessional neurotic vis-a-vis -vis the hysteric is that the hysteric is not burying the emotional difficulty with ideas. Um, he claims that the obsessions are more varied, meaning that, and, and in some sense, he's saying that the obsessional ideas are more superficial. Um, that's why they're more varied. They can kind of take any form. Um, I can give a few examples for this in the chat. Um, but he claims that when it comes to hysteria, it's more about a direct fear or a direct anxiety. Um, so I know in the contemporary psychology literature, for example, there's the a stereotype that's kind of been concerned, uh, you know, um, proven or justified, uh, which is that women experience more negative emotions than, than men. And it's interesting because here Freud's identifying that hysteria and the primary affect of hysteria is this overwhelming fear and anxiety. So it's not so much that the hysteric becomes, so again, it's not so much the hysteric becomes obsessed with ideas, but it's more that the hysteric becomes overwhelmed by fear and anxiety directly. Um, he says that this can manifest in, 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 in some variation, not as much as the obsession, but more direct things like night. He, he, he names night, solitude, death, illness, snakes, and height. Um, so the crucial thing here is that the hysteric is in some sense closer to the ground, you see. Um, there's something almost more real about the hysteric. Um, 
the types of things that the hysteric is experiencing fear and anxiety about are in principle rational things like night, solitude, death, illness, snakes, a common one in religious symbolism, of course, height. Um, but that there is not this, the, the, you know, the difference between the hysterical phobias and the uh, obsessional ideas is that the hysterical phobias, they don't, they, they, because it's closer to the ground, they don't change as much. They're more constant. It's again to this emotional state that's kind of a constant. Um, and again, this is linked to trauma and this is linked to, to emotional disturbances. And he says, you know, extremely hysterical subjects can have bouts of anxiety attacks. They're just attacked by these, these overwhelming paralysis of the idea. Again, it's, it, it's more close to the body, it seems. Um, and then of course, like in the previous papers, he says, you know, these phobias and these obsessions, both this bifurcation, they can be mixed, they can coexist. It's not a strict, it's not, it, we can't make super clear categories and say, you know, you either have the obsessions or you have the hysteria, there's, there's overlap. Um, and there's often a case of what he called in a previous paper, mixed neuroses. So, and to, to give the example of the, the mixed neuroses and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop as he, he says a quote, you can have a phobia along with a true substantive, a substantive uh, substitutive obsession, substitutive obsession, which is again, this, this idea. Um, then maybe before we go into the, 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 the conversation about this, I think it's, it's, it's important to note that Freud here is on, he, it's so obvious in the early writings, he's really concerned with the subject. So he says here a quote about both the obsessions and the hysteria, but this one's particularly about the obsessions. He says, the emotional state as such is always justified. So what that means is he's saying, yes, he's saying, okay, the obsessional neurotic idea is not really justified. But what he's saying is, is that the emotional state, which originally disturbs the subject is always justified. So there is something to be, so what he's saying is there is a real incom incompatibility or there is a real contradiction at the heart of the subject um, is, 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 one, is one way to think of that. Um, and, and I guess with, with that being said, why don't we why don't we jump into a conversation about about this about this text? Okay. Um, anyone anyone want to start us off? Yes. Do you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Daniel. Oh, hi. So I have one thing to add to this in my notes here, see, which is anxiety neurosis talks about this as well, right? And the way I understand it, the way I understand phobias is that basically. You have anxiety neurosis, which for him is sort of sexual tension that accumulates and whatever. So sexual stress, maybe, I don't know. Um, and the idea is that the, the phobia can, can be a manifestation of, of this. So I think it's a nuance interesting to notice that he is actually saying that, I mean, because like fears and stuff like this are, as he says, not a problem. Uh, but the problem for him seems to be the sexual dimension that makes it a phobia for, for Freud, right? Which I think was interesting. And then also, in the end, he basically makes, as you also note, like he combines the different things. For example, you can have sexual tension that becomes anxiety neurosis that manifests as a phobia, then it's, then it's substituted for a true obsession, etc. And then you can have like, yeah, you may be, you have a phobia from your body. Oh, I don't want to, I want to control my body. And then you basically uh, uh, substitute this and have some, and this is so, in some sense a, um, a dualistic understanding of the body then, right? In this case seven that he, he talks about in the end, like uh, exemplify this combination of these different things that you basically, in, in one level you are against your body and the other, other level you are, substituting this for an idea that's really dysfunctional in some sense, right? Yeah, yes. and, and, and I end with all of this is because she doesn't like her husband, you know, that's the end. <laughs> so, 
So it's, it, in the end, it's all sexual, you know. So yeah, so that I think that's you know the sexual dimension. I think you cannot forget that, right? That everything here seems to be more or less about sexuality, which we will come to later more. On, right? Yeah, and in the in the in the next in the next paper, we're going to be going into that more directly. Can you can you um, maybe go into a little more detail about this this dualism you're noting? Because a lot of a lot of people a lot of people sort of um, make this claim that Freud is a is a dualistic thinker. What the way I'm the way I think of, the way I think about it is that there's the, there's this trauma which is sexual in nature. And that there's a split which occurs in the subject, almost like a tension between the body and the idea. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, how, how would you how would you interpret that? Okay. Well, I don't. In this paper, he doesn't talk about traumas that much. He talks about, in, in my reading at least, like he talks about traumas in the sense of intense obsessions, right? But that he said leaves out that. Oh, it's not so important. Talking about true obsession, so they connect it with effects, right? So in this paper, he doesn't talk so much about traumas. Uh, this the other papers, but he's talking about this anxiety neurosis that that is, doesn't have a psychical mechanism, which would be the the trauma aspect, I guess, right? The, the, so in the, so yeah, in, in this paper, he doesn't really talk about uh, traumas that much, actually. No, just that there's this, there's this, in, there's this original incompatibility, or there's this yes, original yes, substitution, right? Yes, yes. So there, so like there, the way I'm thinking about it is there is this, there's like kind of an like an original, like there's like the oneness is kind of like an incompatibility or a contradiction. Is this how I'm trying to think about it? Is that there's this original incompatibility or contradiction, which is kind of one event or one situation. Mm -hmm. And then there's a splitting as a consequence of that, which is the which to me would be the dualism. Ah, okay. The dualism was more the, it was more in the particular in case seven in the text. And that was more about, you know, she uh, the, the patient he describes ha has like said, Oh, I want to breathe, but no, I don't I might I don't want to breathe. That's as if she can control her own breathing with her thoughts, you know, this type of very strange ideas. This was the dual, was in this context, I was thinking like dualistic idea that, oh, I can control my breathing, like I can breathe. And also breathing can also mean, you know, I've been treated by the way. So it can also have this other meaning, which is also interesting, but yeah. So yeah, so it was in this particular uh, context that I was thinking I see. about the dualism, right? Yeah. I see, I see, I see. But he does. I, I agree. I agree with you that he's. He's. I mean, of course, this is this is stand, standard Freud. Is that he? He's. He's linking it. The, the for him the or the original problem is is a sexual one, and he, he he states it as such in this saying, the anxiety neuroses too has a sexual origin as far as I can see, but it does not attach itself to ideas taken from sexual life. So, I think that's to me that's the crucial notion. Is the crucial notion is that. You know, and I think that this is important for our contemporary times as well, because I feel like there are a lot of people who are complaining about external problems, which to me seem very disconnected from the real of their life. Um, like I could tell, for example, a story about I was at working at an institute last year where um, a young a young woman came to give a presentation about um, ecology and uh, extinction of animals, and she was ended up breaking down in tears about dolphins. And me and my boss at the time were basically confused and perplexed. Um, how could she be so upset about this event, which seems very far from her? And then we ended up spending a week with her and I ended up finding out that she had a very messed up sexual life and she was juggling two boyfriends at the time. So there's this, there's this way in which the real problem, and when we went into the, her problem with the boyfriends, there was just a contradiction, meaning that there were some things in one boy she liked, there were some things in another boy she liked, she didn't know how to work this out, 
there's just a contradiction. And so, and, and there's no solution to the contradiction. So it makes sense to get distance from it and to maybe get obsessed with dolphins or get obsessed with ecology. And then you don't have to deal with it. And I think that that's the crucial notion is, is that you see in so many activists or so many scientists or so many philosophers, and, you know, and I'm just reflecting on this for my personal life, you know, like, like I've had the same thing happen to me over and over again in my life and with others. So it's so fascinating. So fascinating to me. And, and yeah, just, just, yeah, go on, go on, Dimitri. Okay. No, that, uh, fuck, am I forgetting what I wanted to say? No, this idea that, you know, if, because now I'm going to see all political debates, which get heated as, aha, okay, these are sexual problems, these are yours. And uh, so, yeah, that's really fascinating because, you know, I had this same thing. I couldn't sleep. And I just kept thinking of this one obsessional idea, you know, it doesn't matter what it was. It was substituted anyway. But uh, yeah, I don't know. That it doesn't matter in the end. But isn't this so problematic? Is Because what are we doing now? We are, aren't we basically now dealing with substitutive ideas? I think that there's a there's there's a level of self-reflectivity that enters. There's a level of self-reflectivity because there's a difference between the person who is obsessed with an idea very distant from their real personal life and then is unable to even acknowledge that the real problem lies beneath so to speak. Whereas like for me for example, yes Clearly, I have this weird obsessional drive with academic literature and, um, you know, and in some sense, I can't escape, you know, this drive I have. Um, but the only way I found to make it healthy and the only way I've healthy, quote, unquote, like the only way I've found to like, sort of make it more conscious is to directly go to the, the, the source of my body energy and to analyze my psyche. And I find the Freudian tools to be a way to not only help myself with better understanding myself, but to then translate that into, into therapeutic practice for others, potentially. So like the core point that you're making that I would like to put a little more attention on is the fact that when we have all these political problems today, you know, like the political sphere is a mess um, and our political life is insane. Um, we never talk about the coincidence between the political and the sexual. Um, this is something that Alenka Zupancic makes very clear. Uh, Alenka Zupancic has a, a great um, essay called The Sexual is Political. And, and I think she has like, the sexual is political, the political is sexual. Um, and basically, I think it's about, it's about um, the sexual and the political are both about our social organization and they're both about our boundaries that we make with the other. And so both of those dimensions, I think are mirrored in each other. And so when we have political problems, like, I mean, there's a few I could name, the ones that are closest to my own consciousness are the ones in North America with, le with left and right. Um, but with all of those tensions, um, you never really get to the core problem because you never really talk about the lived sexual life of the people, the, in, in this case, the American people. Um, and I think that that would absolutely change the nature of the conversation. I mean, in potentially quite profound ways, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is interesting because um, what I think of is that, you know, the political is always personal in some sense. So let's say if you are working class and you live in a neoliberal, uh, you know, we live in neoliberal capitalism. So you are going to be affected by austerity and these kinds of things, which means that, you know, you can f like, but on the other hand, these are like abstract forces of capital, 
which are totally like impersonal and to get heated about that doesn't make any sense but still it's personal in some sense so it's yeah it's really a hard thing to deal with i think um because for example here in the netherlands every year we have um like a Santa Claus kind of party, but the helpers of the Santa Claus are basically slaves with a black face, you know? Um, so since a few years, we have getting, we're getting so many heated debates in this country, you know, also in my family. And um, the whole thing is that, you know, it can get heated and it can be personal, but that is still in the guise of a substitution or that, no, that's still a substitution for the real sexual problem. Absolutely. So, yeah. So how do you say, like, uh, telling the truth to lie or something like, like that? Like, like, here's the thing, like, with the example you're giving of the slaves in blackface. Like, think about how that is a political statement and a sexual statement. So, for example, if you're capable of um, incorporating as a part of your ritual um, these these figures in blackface who are meant to be representative of African slaves or something, you are otherizing them, like they're not us, like they're, they're the other, which doesn't just mean that they can be a political pawn, but it also means that they are sexual other. Like we don't, we don't mix with those. So it's, so it's also so it's also a sexual it's also a sexual statement and a, a political statement at the same time. Although the level of the sexual statement is not wouldn't be explicitly addressed. It would always be implicit. So I think unless you get to that level, you're dealing with the substitution and not the original emotional problem. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that's interesting. I think also that um, because the, the people who are against this, first of all, say people who are for this, um, which is the majority of people in the Netherlands, according to polls, they say it's not, not, it's not black people. It just happens because they go into the chimney, which is, uh, yeah, a verwerfung, like Freud calls it. How do you say it in English? I forgot. Um, disavowal, I think. And on the other hand, the people who are uh, against this, they, uh, uh, oh, wait, I forgot what I want to tell me. Sorry, the people who are against it and the people who are for it. Yeah, yeah, the, the people who are for it, they, they disavow this, that it's yeah, black people. It's black people yeah. And the people who are, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the people who are against it, you know, it's, it's, there's no way to, it's basically the contradictory thing itself, maybe, how to put it, like, there's no way for these people to talk with each other, because the one is saying it's a colonial character, and the other people are saying it's not even a black person, so, I don't know, it's interesting how this is a societal incompatible idea, maybe, so it's touching some real, but yeah, how yeah. far is it a substitution or not? Well, I think on the level of on the le like on the level you're bringing it to, you can see the contradiction. Um, but that's because you're not. But I'm assuming that's because, or that you're even capable of doing that because you're not strongly identifying with either position or one position over or something like this. Like, it gives you a little space to see the contradiction and to see sort of it the drama playing out among the people who are strongly identifying with the idea. Uh, when listening to this, uh, I was I was thinking about about an idea. I, I wonder if you agree with me in 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 how I, I see obsessional uh, symptoms in my own experience. How they appear? One could perhaps say some sort of type of phenomenology of obsession or something. But uh, in a way, one can one can easily recognize that the kind of practice what that one does when one reads or writes or whatever artistic practice and so on it's always having to do with obsessions and uh, 
So, but there is a there is a difference. There is there is some difference in when somebody has owned their own practice and does what they do in a conscious manner. So the way I why way I see it, it's that uh, kind of uh, obsessions that Freud is dealing with here are uh, kind of obsessions that give rise to some kind of confusion or some kind of like. It's, 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 it's a way of producing some kind of like mental confusion in a certain situation where the subject confronts an other who provokes or who whatever due to the subject's own ideas, the, the other is always recognized by the idea that one has about the other. This is the basic lesson that comes really prominent later on in, in Freudian thinking. But the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, there is a difference when one is cognizant about this issue to the person who is not really recognizing what is going on and just get confused in their ideas. But maybe the kind of Lacanian idea that later on gets developed that this is a, this is a structural phenomenon. It is not spontaneous that one gets confused or loses one's tracks when in thoughts when confronting the issue of the dolphins or I don't know. But I wonder if you agree that there is this kind of difference about obsession. I think I think it's an important distinction because, like, the one thing that I always wrestle with personally is, like, in some ways I have to repeat, like, and in some ways becoming, quote unquote, obsessed with something, is quite useful in some in some ways, and I and I and I find it quite natural. Um, to fall down a rabbit hole, so to speak. I, I, I think, I think it's, I think it's, I think a lot of joy and a lot of greatness has come from, for me personally, my capacity to do this. I, so I think this distinction between whether or not one's obsession is coming from a place of deep consciousness of self, or whether or not one's obsession is kind of a creating a mess in one's life and taking one further away from the real problems of their life is a, an essential one. Like for the example I gave with the woman and the dolphins and the ecology, it was kind of obvious that there was a disturbance in her personal life, which was so profound that she should probably take care of it before she figures out what she wants to do with her career type of thing. But it's complex. It's complex. I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, sure. It's. But, it's. It, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I was thinking that maybe we could also discuss addictions in this manner, since I think that addictions are, in a way, really uh, powerful ways of getting one's own mind confused in a systematic manner. One can. Perhaps if, if one has experienced some type of addictions, recognize the experience of losing one's track in thoughts or getting confused about what is one doing and then finding some comfort from some kind of object, which always uh, proceeds with some kind of mental disturbance or mental confusion or one could boil down to the concept of contradiction here. So maybe maybe some kind of distinction between two types of uh, subjective, uh, one, one could say approaches towards this contradiction, which is inevitable in, if we accept Freud's ideas. Uh, right. there's, there's this di different way of locating the, 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 what is the central contradiction or incompatibility. There is a way of sort of displacing the contradiction onto some other issue or some other place. So one well, has, to, has to recognize that there is some original place for it also. Dan Daniel, did you want to say something? Yeah, well, I just got to think about what he means by like pathology when he talks about, because it's related a little bit to the addiction, what Mike's talking about the addiction here. So, I mean, it was interesting because people talk about pathology in so many different ways. And like what do Freud mean, or whatever? And um, 
like this was very interesting because they said like it was like effective state that that continue indefinitely that would basically sort of be like an addiction right you could maybe i'm not uh maybe that could be addiction right and then it's like memories that no longer relate to the actual one that would be like the contradiction of the, uh, right so yeah i don't i don't have anything more to add but i just saw this parallel to what was said I just wanted to I just wanted to go on what Mika was saying about the the addiction a little bit because it reminds me of something uh, I kind of made as a joke um, in an in an in an academic conversation I don't know two three weeks ago. Um, dangerous. I think there's huh. Dangerous. Yeah. That's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I did. The the joke the joke was kind of I mean it's a politically incorrect joke but I I I said um uh in in the in the west in the west we let women be free and we got we got obsessed with alcohol and in Islam we banned alcohol and we uh let and we banned and we kept women you know locked in the home type of thing so it's like it's like we, it was like we 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 dealt with the contradiction differently but <laughs> it's like. Um, you know, it, it, in the West, in order for women to be free, we had to at least get addicted to alcohol so <laughs> we, we could deal with the trauma of the freedom. <laughs> but um, yeah, but this, this, this clear, clearly, clearly when it comes to addiction, you have alcoholism, you have cigarette addiction, you have addiction to opioids, you have addiction to all sorts of different substances which clearly lead one into a very confused type of thinking, a very, almost a, lo a lower level state of cognition, potentially. And, you know, what, to, to, what, to what extent are, are these substitution, st substituted ideas? You know, to what extent are these, we're not talking about abstract ideas, we're talking about alcohol as idea, cigarette as idea. Um, and to what extent are these ideas substitutions for even phallic representation? Um, I mean, I think that's an interesting path to follow. Like in my mind, I, I'm, I, I, I think that's a it's potentially a, a useful way to think about these these problems. I know there's an interesting pattern in my life which might be of interest and to this to this idea of addiction and the role in sexual problems, which was I noticed in my 20s when I had a girlfriend, I didn't smoke weed. When I didn't have a girlfriend, I would smoke weed. Eventually the weed has won and the women are <laughs> But I always noticed that pattern in myself. It was like, oh, I, I, got, I, I got into a breakup immediately. <laughs> I would... So I don't, I don't know what to extent that that, 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 that rings true in my life. It rings true. Does anyone else have anything they'd they'd like to contribute to this this article on on obsessions and phobias or any 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 wisdom you'd like to depart uh, to to impart on us? No, I had just a question uh, because it was unclear to me, and that was about the contingent phobias. Uh, and I mean, I don't really understand this. Actually, it talks about like agoraphobia, that's a pair of uh, crowds, right? I guess and and phobias related to locomotion and stuff. I don't really understand how, what he's talking about here and why they are contingent or anything like this. I don't really understand this all, at all, actually. So if, if someone has some insight there, that would be very interesting because he could talk about common phobias. That makes very much sense, right? You have death, illness, uh, snakes, solitude, night, whatever. Everyone, but why is, why is this phobias contingent? I don't understand this, actually. It's almost it's almost like for me when he he's naming and please someone because I don't I don't know hundred percent but what I would say is 
when he's describing the common phobias, they're kind of like, um, they're almost like archetypes of things we fear. Like, like they're, like they're, they're, they're kind of like universal. Like that's what I was saying about like the snakes, like the snake is, the snake is in all religious symbolism. Like that, we, that they play some like height, height, like, like when I think about night, solitude, death, illness, and, and height, those are evolutionarily, they make sense. Whereas the contingent phobias are more, seem to be historically conditioned by that subject's own existence. Does that make sense? Yeah, on, on this very, on this level, makes sense yeah. to describe it, but yeah, we can, we can leave it behind, we can talk about something else. Well, what, you know, go, you, if you want to go deeper, we can. I, I just, I don't, I, I don't know how to make sense of it in any other way. No, that, that's why maybe we can leave it then, because... Well, I would like to jump in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe, maybe, well, throw this here, uh, emphasizing how phobias are kind of boring. They're, they're monotonous, typical, <laughs> and phobias are, in a way, probably for him, easy to confront, but maybe he's recognizing something a bit more complex or harder to deal with, which is some kind of mixed anxiety neurosis or anxiety attacks. I, I mean, I have had anxiety attacks at some stage in my life when things were a bit more messy than they are now. So I, I can uh, confirm that when, when Freud says that this kind of anxiety attack, it is not something that derives from some special memory from from some le earlier stage, as is the case in his uh, neurotic patients. Uh, so there, there, is a, there is a tendency perhaps to mystify this, this issue in, in some sense, since it's, it's not the case that there is some deeper or some kind of more complex issue going on inside. It, it may be just some kind of nervous states which relates more to the current condition that the subject is in so so the so the so the object which gets this role of provoking anxiety or whatever it's it's it may be whatever but the issue is more with the the current uh health or current yes okay so that, that was I, what i was my impression was yes yes so this is obviously a very reasonable view of this i think i think that we, we maybe if we go to the ne next paper we, we can connect this a bit more because then it talks about like uh the, the different causes and stuff like this so and like for example the cost of civilization like common causes and sexual causes and stuff like this. Because I, I think that when he, that's what, what confuses me is when he talks about phobias, the way I understand it, maybe I misunderstand it actually, but the way I understand it, it's like, when you talk about phobias, for him it seems to be like most this, like this sexual build up tension thing. That's, so that's why I don't really understand this, why, what he's talking about. But maybe I just completely misunderstood this and it's only evolutionary, you know, the difference between continuing common and that would be very, very reasonable, makes perfect sense. But you know, yeah, so maybe we can leave this or something, we'll talk something else. Yeah, I also think that maybe the, the kind of uh, issues or mental health problems that he's discussing here, they're, 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 they, they also seem to be a bit like, how would, how would one say, maybe a bit, uh, not exact in their definition. They are, they are a bit muddled or maybe even lost during the span of history. I mean, the kind of categorizations that they're going on. All right, well then let's, 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 move, let, let's move on to the next one and it's titled Heredity and the Etiology of, of, of the Neuroses. So, Let's see where to start with this. So here's to me, to me in this paper, this is where 
he makes it sort of even that much more clear that he's 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 identifying sex and you know sexuality specifically as the cause of the neuroses and he's he's delimiting this as specific uh cause over what he's calling the critique of charcot um the charcot's etiological theory of the neuroses which are again sort of more due to sort of more fit phys physicalist explanations and not really identifying uh the specific cause of of, of sexuality itself um, when he says sexuality is the cause, he says either it's some sort of disorder or some important event. Um, so you could say either disorder or important event, the crucial notion of event over process as some event that sort of changes the way you see reality. Um, an event which, which retroactively changes your identity or uh, yeah, you know, an, an event which you, you didn't see coming, but which, which kind of just changes the coordinates of your, the way you perceive things. Um, he does say specifically here that he was able to reach, and this is like the first time, at least according to, uh, this is the first time I'm, um, I, the first, as far as I know, this is the first place where he mentions psychoanalysis as a method. Um, and this is the first place where he says, I was able to make this claim of sexuality as the cause of the neuroses through using the psychoanalytic method, uh, which he says was co-developed by Joseph Brewer and which identifies uh, the origin of our self in trauma and also enables us to explore through this method what he calls obscure pathways of unconscious ideation. And that's, I think, the crucial way to understand the subject. I think it's such a, a nice way to frame it. Um, quote, the, uh, say it again here, this obscure pathways of unconscious ideation. So it's kind of like the source of a subject's ideation before it reaches consciousness, it's already gone through a complex web or a complex network of associations which obscure the original idea. Um, and so it, it makes sense. It makes, it makes sense in some ways that if you, if you, if you freely associate back into the subject's life, that their original ideational problems are coming from what you could call the, the life force. Um, so it, it kind of, it, it intuitively makes a lot of sense to me that that it, it's it's kind it's kind of it's kind of like you know the reason why I love this so much is because you know when I was studying evolutionary theory if you want to understand life you follow life back to the original life or if you want to understand the universe you follow the universe back to the original event of the big bang so it's kind of like through the free association you're following the subject back through their obscure path of ideation back to their original notion of self. Um, and that this is connected to, to life force it makes, makes sense to me. Um, so basically saying that sexuality is quote, an agent cause of the neuroses. Um, and another interesting thing is that he identifies the experience before puberty that causes the trauma is quote, a passive experience. So it's something that happens to the subject. It's not something that the subject actively does. It's kind of something that, an event that occurs to the subject, um, which I think is, is, is important for then trying to understand both the hysteria and the obsessional neuroses where hysteria is seen as closer to the ground and more passive, whereas the obsessional neuroses is seen as further from the ground and active. So it's, it's, you can see here that, you know, and it's interesting to note on a side note that um, I had an important discussion with, with um, a friend who had a sex change and he went from being a, in a female body to being in a male body. And he described the hormone treatment of going into a male body as something that made him restless. It's something that made him more active. It's something he couldn't, his energy was, was, was different. And 
that the fact that this energy in the male body specifically takes it further away from the original event in some sense. It, 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 the male subject gets lost in the ideas, so to speak. Um, you know, and as a consequence of perhaps of this of this event, this passive event which occurs to them. Um, see the sexual event. Um, another interesting thing is that this sexual event is only something, and, and I think Zizek and Zizek's philosophy, he identifies this really well. This, sex, this sexual event is retroactively traumatized. That's, that's crucial, is that it wasn't an event which was traumatic at the time it occurred necessarily. I know Zizek gives the example of a child that sees his parents having sex or something like that in their bedroom. Like this notion that at the time, you don't even know what you're seeing, but when you're a teenager afterwards, it becomes traumatizing thinking of that. Um, this is the type of thing he's, he's saying. And this basic mechanism of this retroactivity of trauma is something that, that's mobilized a lot in their philosophical work. Um, let's see here. Uh, the only other really important things to note are things I've kind of gone over already, but we can rehash them. Like the most important one is that um, that the structure of the obsessional ideas, according to Freud, are not things that the obsessional subject wants to deal with, according to him, quote, because the subject himself anticipates a sexual enjoyment from them. So you could see here how the substitutive sexual idea then becomes the vehicle through which the subject's ego thinks that they're going to get a sexual enjoyment. Um, that's very interesting. I would like to go into that a little more because when I think about that self-reflectively, I'm like, wow, that, 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 that's, that's something else. Um, and also like that it makes the psychoanalytic method that much more important and that much more difficult because it's important because you have to break down a lot of the resistances to approaching the core problem, but it makes it more difficult because the method is useless if the subject doesn't submit to analysis. If the subject doesn't submit to analysis, it's, you can't do this. You can't use the psychoanalytic method, not, not, at least not clinically. Um, and then again, what we've already rehashed, but I'll just rehash it again, is that Freud links, you see here how Freud's going to link ancient metaphysical principles for his starting point on discussing the neuroses, where he says, the obsessions are, quote, the active element, and the phobias are the passive element, which to me means, again, just to rehash, that the phobias and the hysteria are closer to the side of the real, and the obsessions and the obsessional ideas are further from the side of the real, which to me now, when I, when I read and try to interpret Zizek's philosophy, it makes a lot of sense that Zizek calls the masculine side kind of more um, fraudulent, um, an imposter, whereas he sees subjectivity as such as more feminine. Um, and I see here this reflected in Freud's original uh, papers discussing the origin of the neuroses. So it's, 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 I just, I just find it so fascinating. So that's it for this paper. Um, there are a few things I think that are worth here going into great detail. Um, anyone who wants to start us off, please, please do, or else I'll, I'll. Okay. Yeah. So like that's, I didn't really follow your things there. I didn't understand everything you said, but maybe you can explain a bit more. But anyway, the, the thing here what was, was interesting was that um, uh, so he talks about different causes, right? And he's against his general description to having genetic, like character, genetic causes or, you know, cultural, civil, civil, like common causes, like everyone gets exposed to. He doesn't like this explanational model that says that everything that happens to everyone, that's the reason for this in neurosis. So, um, so the, the interesting thing though is that when he like he talks about the genetic cause, as I'm calling it, I'm calling it the genetic, he didn't know about the genetics, the genetics of course, but um, anyway, 
he talks about like loop multiplier or he talks about like electric circuit or something like this in, in the paper that I call loop multiplier. So it's like you have genetic like that uh, makes it possible to have certain symptoms or whatever. And then the sexual things then directs this in different directions. I, that's what an interesting like idea that, that he, he talks about. He talks about it later in the, in the next paper also, this idea, but in a different context. But this was the, the, the thing that I noted the most, I think. And yeah, and then it basically says the same thing, thing as you also <laughs> noted. So yeah. Uh, and yeah. What was that? What was that la the last point you wanted to make there that, that you said I brought up already? Did you say what was the last thing you were saying there? There was another important point you wanted to bring up, but you said I mentioned it. Uh, well, okay, so um, I have like 10 points to bring up, but uh, okay. uh, I don't need to bring them all up. But I think that. Um, you just wanted to emphasize this loop here, right? Yes, yes. I think that was I emphasized when I reread the different papers. I thought it was the most most interesting the way he thought about the hereditary thing as some sort of loop. I don't know, know exactly how we think about this. You could maybe think about this in logical, like in the last work, like it's like going around, you know, in, like in all religions and stuff like this. But like the idea is that nothing really changes, and and I think what he's trying to think here is is how when we live in civilization, how this changes, you know, these impulses, right? And, and how to direct these impulses in, in, in fruitful ways or constructive ways or how we want to frame it. So I think this is some sort of what, this I think is crucial to understand what the psychoanalysis tries to accomplish if they like succeed, right? It's it's all it's almost like um, it's almost like he's identifying or like what you're describing here is kind of like the original identification of what might become the notion of sublimation. But just this 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 notion that in civilization our our impulses are themselves transformed and and necessary and necessarily so so um, yeah I mean just the there's a huge price, and this this we I mean that's, this this of course becomes the foundation of civilization and its discontent. So, you can save that. I don't want to slow down the momentum of the conversation at all, but um, I had some basic questions about the about actually still falling from the previous paper, but it goes into these ones about the categories Freud is Freud is using and whether. Is, is anxiety neurosis as a category, this includes phobias and then excludes obsessional characteristics? And I had a question about that. And also, I'm not familiar with this term neurasthenia. And I guess neurasthenia is like, it's like neurosis without this retroactive element having to do with sort of like things just purely in the present that are not being, you know, unconsciously recollected from the past at all? If anybody could answer that? Well, like, I don't know, maybe how I remember, there were well, many questions. The thing I remember you said was basically the, the last thing, which, and then, could you repeat? Uh, there is neurasthenia. Which yes, yes, yes. So, so the thing about neurasthenia is like, isn't it like the the new? He was a neurologist a little bit, and he has his. So the the idea is that part of this is neuro, neurological sort of, isn't that the point there? Maybe I've also misunderstood this, but that's how I understand it. It's like part of this is explained in this sense, but then he wants to leave room for the sexual explanations also, and not only talk about neurology. So this is how I'm, I'm reading, understanding what he's talking about here. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's funny because when I look up, when I when I type it into the Googles, it says neurasthenia is, a, is an ill-defined medical condition characterized by lassitude, fatigue, headache, and irritability associated chiefly with emotional disturbance. Yes, um, but but in, in this paper they are talking about trying trying to explain what the causes for these different symptoms is, and I think 
in this mm. paper, like what they're talking about is like there are different types of causes. And in this argument, he's talking about how I remember it, what is the symptoms, whatever, is explained at the time as neuro neurology, like pure neurology, I think, basically. And and and, and Freud is saying, no, we I, I'm not going to buy literature. We we have to talk also about sexuality. We can almost only talk about neurology. Basically, that's that's how I understand what he is trying to do. And then the same thing is repeated in the next paper, by the way. So with the with the definition you read there, Adley, it, it almost it almost sounds like um, it would be a, a definition that Freud might might agree with because he's he's basically I mean being meaning that this condition is caused chiefly with an emotional disturbance. Um, I think that that's that's I mean from the first paper I mean I think that's what he's basically trying to get at is that these neurotic symptoms are caused by something. Uh, originally disturbing or emotionally disturbing in the, in in the beginning of a subject's life, and then in this paper, and well, in other papers as well, he's, he's linking that directly to sexuality. But with your first uh, your first question there, uh, with the cat, you're at, you're asking the question about the categories he's using. Um, so, like in the previous paper and in in previous papers from last week, um, I think we discussed that. Freud has mentioned a few times that um, there are mixed neuroses. So he, he does make a distinction between two primarily, the, the, the hysteria and the obsessional neuroses. But he also says that there's mixed neuroses where you can, and I, and I gave a quote from the previous paper there where he says, let me just, let me just pull up that, that quote again, if I can find it. Where we're basically saying that you can have you can have these obsessions and these phobias at the same time, uh, so he he is leaving room for mixed, a mixed mixed description. Let's see if I for uh, sure. Well, yeah. well, I had a question: was how does anxiety neurosis fit fit into this? Like, what does anxiety neurosis cover exactly? Well, I I know that. So go go for it, Daniel. Okay, so that is basically a buildup of sexual tension in, in what he's talking about. So it doesn't have a psychological, not psychical mechanism, that's, it, that's uh, but it's like, yeah, so the specific cause is due to accumulation of sexual tension. So that's what anxiety neurosis is, according to my- Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I get, that much, but it's it's anxiety neurosis is including what all of the psychoneuroses, or is it it's it's obsessions and not something no, else? No, no. Or? So the thing there is that uh, anxiety neurosis usually goes as the uh, underlying things for the other type of neurosis in. Mm. So this is why it also sort of mixed all the time. So you can you, the different things are. He think think of it like different things influencing each other, causing a, a complex picture. So you can't really narrow in on one description, oh, I have this, like you do in, like, you know, so you have to think more dynamically, like how these different things influence each other, I think, to understand the, the nuance and in, in this, I think. All right, cool, thank you. There's, he makes some interesting statements in his early papers about the status of anxiety specifically, sort of, sort of hinting at that the 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 depth of our subjective emotional troubles find find uh, uh, like anxiety plays a somehow a central role. Um, of course, this is carried on and built on in Lacan, where he he writes a whole seminar on anxiety you know, claiming that anxiety is caused when the object of desire is too close. Um, I know there's some statements by Zizek where he says that anxiety is the only emotion that doesn't lie. Um, so, so both Freud, Lacan and Zizek place an interesting amount of attention and place a, an interesting amount of importance on the status of anxiety. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I've, I, 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 can, I can say that in all major events of my life um, where I've had to perform or I've had to go on the stage of, in some way, 
anxiety, not literally, but you know, more figuratively, uh, anxiety plays just an enormous role in, in, in whether or not I can perform or whether or not I can overcome that emotion. Yes. It's just so fundamental. It is, I, I just had a parallel thing what we talk about, but she shakes uh, when you talk about eventology, because in, in that, in that, in less than nothing, he talks about this. It, like in, um, then he says, you know, there is different between pseudo enthusiasm and like true enthusiasm in an element, right? And the underlying for this is anxiety or terror, even, you know, for, for, for an event, right? So. Yeah. Um... Can I jump in? I um, what I read from this paper is an idea you've introduced me to, Kadal, um, because he was talking about hereditary, and then he was saying like, no, it's this retroactive traumatizing of a previous event. But isn't this like pointing both towards primal trauma? You know, the idea that we are as like. I guess in the in individuated creatures of libido, you know, we can't handle this <laughs> this uh, sexual energy we have, and that's. Oh, you're muted, by the way. But, uh, go, go, sorry, continue your yeah, thought. Yeah, and that now I I was also thinking that you know the, in this in regards of substitution isn't the retroactively determined trauma then a substitution for primal trauma. Yeah, I mean, us uh, see. For me, like that, that conversation, I, I don't know whether Freud ever says primal trauma. I don't know if Freud ever uh, frames it in that way. I know that that appears in Lacan. Like Lacan has, has like Lacan even makes jokes about Freudian, he makes jokes about Freudian psychoanalysts um, when he says, um, he says, they think that the infant wants the mother when they really want the placenta. You know, Lacan says that. So, and, and that's such a Lacanian awesome thing to say, but, <laughs> but um, you know, Freud doesn't, Freud doesn't go to that level. I know I've, I've even spoken to Alenka Zupancic about that. Freud, Freud doesn't, Freud doesn't go to that, go to that level. Um, so I think that it, it's an extension of the theory and I think it's a necessary extension of the theory. Like, like what I always say about Freud is that Freud sets up the Freud sets up the stage for us to think about psychology in a very interesting way, but he needs to be extended and expanded and transformed in many different ways as well. Like, and I, I would say primal trauma is one of those areas. Like, um, I know, for example, there's a, a great psycho psychedelic psychotherapist. Uh, his name's Stan Groff, um, and he talks specifically about how in his model of psychoanalysis, you have to include all of the um, stages of infant development while in the womb. Like if you don't include all of the stages of development in the womb, you're missing the, the real origin, so to speak. So I think that that's necessary. That's, that's necessary. I, I love I love the way in this paper he talks about the the obscure passive ideation because it's 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 kind of like sometimes you feel like like you're talking to a very complex person for example and they've got very complex problems but it's almost like whenever they start talking or whenever they start framing, they've already missed the problem, so to speak. Like they, they got lost in the own density of their own forest of ideas, so to speak, like the, 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 if, if that makes sense. So like, I, I just think that, that the fact that he's in, introducing the method of psychoanalysis, and I wanna, I wanna make an emphasis on that, that what Freud, what's interesting about Freud is that he actually gives a tool that we can use to 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 chip away at this problem, um, but that but that but that basically, you know, like 
that people dramatically complexify themselves and then it's hard to get it's hard to it's hard for them to see what's really what's really what's really bothering them there's been so much going on in their minds before they start speaking that it's it's totally missed i i think that that's also an interesting lesson to take with you into into complex intellectual arguments you know if, if someone's really passionate about something it, it can often be that you're you're just, you're you're interacting with you're interacting with something to x person so let's i'll i'll leave it leave it open if if anyone wants to yeah. say say anything yeah i i think just a com just general comment i i think it it's it's really interesting to see for developing the whole method here in uh, in its early stages here and it's it's interesting to see how it's really becomes an sort of all encompassing theory about human psyche later on but here he seems to be a bit more concerned with the contemporary debate that he's engaging with and trying to just focus his ideas on but the way i see it it's it's really incredible how he can maintain such a uh, I don't know some some kind of real scientific attitude towards this phenomena that he's trying to convince people of that that they are well well the main debate in this paper is with whether the neurotic uh, symptom allows for mainly genetic or heredit hereditary uh, uh, causes or. But what Freud is here reproaching them is that 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 the uh, physician of his day they are too focused on fixing their gaze on these grandiose large scales and they forget to observe the particular cases and when focusing on the particular cases it becomes clear for him that there is always some kind of specific almost indefinable cause with all cases and it's it it necessitates the kind of idea which have since then become normal for us that in treating someone's mental life what matters the most is is their their them focusing on their own uh, memory what ideas it leads them well I think that it is just fantastic to see and how it how he starts to develop this later on into a more general theory it's absolutely absolutely that is it's such i can't even overstate enough how important it is that you're and how well you're articulating this 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 which is still my main problem with when scientists start to approach human beings like i've had it experienced it in the big history community most directly where they they come up with these grandiose large scale systems which totally ignore the singularity of the subject and they're only they're only like basically like a big ego image projection like of their own desire somehow more than it is concerned actually with the problems of the subject um and and that's just it's great to say here that you said that there you know freud's here is reproaching this this gaze uh, that that has it on the grandiose scales and forgets to observe particular cases which which is of course like to me the difference between the scientific universality and the hegelian universality is that the hegelian universality the universal moves through the particular so every single subject and their case is of universal importance you know so this is this is a lovely um practical mobilization of this uh principle i i think it's 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 so so lovely. And then I also wanted to say, maybe I wanted to throw this out to maybe either you, Miko, or Daniel, anyone, but just because you guys have brought this up, is um, could it be said that what Freud's identifying with this loop is already kind of like the precursors of epigenetics? Like the, I don't know. I just that's, that's I, the I idea. I, maybe, maybe not. I think. I think Freud is very much about childhood sexuality, not so much about ancestors' lives. 
and epigenetics is more maybe generational a little bit, but not as far as genetics, right? But I, I, epigenetics is interesting, but I don't really see how it fits with what Freud's talking about. I would say that Freud would really be pleased about the kind of uh, development that's currently going on towards epigenetic explanations. And, uh, but I, I think that he's, he's for, for me, the core something between, already. For me, the core difference between the conventional Darwinian genetic explanations and the epigenetic explanations is basically that the epigenetics is taking seriously the development of the organism. Whereas the Darwinian explanation is taking into consideration more the generational selection process. Of course, Freud's very much interested in the development. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I would like to say comment uh, on the earlier uh, part that sure. what you were saying. Uh, uh, the fact that it is so tempting to go towards the grandiose big pictures and try to yeah. isolate some kind of uh, hereditary picture where well, ultimately, if we follow that line, we end up with uh, the kind of picture that Richard Dawkins presents in his Selfish Gene, where it's just this immortal replicator with his, within us, which is the agent of our mental life, including all kinds of uh, neurosis. But what Freud is here pointing out that if you follow consistently, logically, what's, what's going on when you observe the cases, uh, you end up into some kind of very inconvenient position. What would you, wouldn't you agree? It's, it's, it's very inconvenient. And he, he's here already noting that there is this really like this blockade or this uh, choir of, of, of obstructions that come up when you start to speak about these issues really honestly. So, so what, what, what we can attribute, I think, to Freud is that he's, He's some kind of genius in, in that he, he is able to break through some kind of internal block, which is, which is covering the, 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 the pathway to understanding the, where does the neurotic symptom come from. And, but it's, I think this is, this is something that applies to perhaps all intellectual, intellectual uh, practices in a way. Absolutely. And and it and it, it it really it really also kind of accounts for the intellectual reaction to Freud. Um, go go for it, Daniel. So, well, I mean, I think I love epigenetics. Very interesting, but you know, I don't know that much about epigenetics. But what I seem to understand is that, like, if you if you do think in your daily life, so it doesn't have to be sexual, right? It can affect you, whatever, right? So it's, it's, it's development, not only sexual development, right? But I think that Freud is not really talking about in general, like development, right? He's talking about sexual development that happens in your life, right? And, and how that can become complicated with civilization, right? Which civilization is not epigenetic, by the way. So I think I, I, don't, I don't really, I don't really see exactly how. I mean, even if the time scales are similar, as far as I under, as far as I understand the epigenetic argument, it's that your environment during development, which could be your mental environment, it could be your social environment. It has an it has an impact on your genetic uh, information and what gets passed on generationally. So. In that, in, in that, in that sense, I, 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 that's why I was trying to, to suggest, but, um, but yeah, I do think that following what Mika is saying here about the way Freud is able to break through this internal block is I think like, I would even want to spend a moment talking about how it's different from the way Buddha solves the problem. Because like you could say Buddha you know, was dealing with symptomatic mental life. And for Buddha, he came up with a method, um, me method of meditation and a method of, of, of observing oneself very closely. But it certainly wasn't a method that involved speech acts 
And it wasn't a method that involved sort of going deeper into the structure of memory and the origin of subjectivity where something of a contradictory necessity leads to the, the emergence of adults. And I wonder if that difference is extremely important to understand today when it comes to, I would say, the limits of Buddhism in collective social organization. Because when it comes to actually thinking collective social organization of spirituality, I think we have to include the fact that we're still in language. Uh, we can't we can't really we can't really get out of that um but yeah so maybe because we've got let's say the i want to save some time for the last paper and i think the last paper is the best uh, i think that there's i think that there, there there's 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 one quote there's one quote in particular that just stands out to me as like so prophetic so it's it's called sexuality in the etiology of neuroses um uh, again, he sort of now is just sort of stating as, as a fact that the most immediate and practical cause of neuro neurotic illness is sexual life. Um, he does say that this has been recognized from, quote, time immemorial. Um, he, he says um, that it, it, it merges in sexual complaint and nervous weakness. Um, and I think that that's so universal. Like, if you listen to people talk, if you listen to a bunch of guys or a bunch of girls talking about their sexual life, you know the the number of sexual complaints or or the num the, the the amount of this idea of a nervous weakness that that your your it's almost like your sexual idea is more um, it's more powerful than your bodily capacity, something like that. Like a, there's a nervous system weakness. You know, like that, 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 that the subject struggles with. Um, what I love about this paper is that he starts to actually articulate social ethics. Um, he says it's necessary that we um, start to talk more honestly and openly about our sexual life. He says what is absolutely necessary for his analytic method is that the physician receives a true account of someone's sexual life. Um, and that the biggest risk with the analytic session is actually a social communal problem. So he says it risks ruining family happiness, offending innocent youth, um, uh, uh, disobeying parental authority, all of these social communal dimensions of life. And I feel like what's so strange is why hasn't psychoanalysis been better embedded in our societies? Why have, why don't we have communal and social models of psychoanalysis where right at the beginning he's saying you can't solve these problems really with just individuals isolated by themselves it's it because it's such a social affair and of course it's a social affair you know like it's so so important to, to emphasize that um but he doesn't always so there's the ethics of the subject going under analysis um and the ethics is to give as true an account and be as courageous and as brave as you can to give a true account of your sexual life. But he says, also there's a duty on the side of the doctor, which is the duty is to have a maturity when it comes to sexuality. Um, and that you can't basically be this immature man or immature woman who you know, gets little giggles about sexuality or, or, or like gets some sort of like weird entertainment, like someone is telling me about their kinks and their, quirks like so there's a double there's a double responsibility is the crucial so basically what what is it it's honesty and maturity honesty and maturity this is this is a precondition and and and, and not not only a precondition but a duty we have um he says he says about honesty about sexual things he says quote there cannot be anything except a gain for sexual morality. So he's not being like, Freud is not this cheap moralist about sexuality, you know, like we can't talk about sexual things because we have to be moral, clean subjects. But no, it's to be actually moral, we have to be truthful, fully truthful. You accept the truth, then you can be actually moral. 
I, I think that this is this is this is important for today. Um, let's see. Uh, he he does make he does make some claims about masturbation, um, saying that it can be a source of shame and also exhaustion. Um, he actually says he actually says what we we so it's interesting this workshop so interesting because he comes to a conclusion in this paper which we came to from discussing his earlier papers where he says um, that narcotics addiction is a substitute for a lack of sexual satisfaction so alcohol cigarettes whatever can be a a, a substitute for sexual lack um then I want to just give two direct quotes, which I think are so important. He makes the claim that it, he says this would be the greatest triumph of humanity if we would raise the responsible act of procreating children to the level of a deliberate and intentional activity and in freeing it from its entanglement with the necessary satisfaction of a natural need. So what he's saying there is that we should be brave enough to build intentional communities and intentional families where we, we raise the idea of sexuality to the level of, of maturity and responsibility that it requires instead of just, ha you know, like the way you'll have it today is like, we can't talk about these things like where, like, for example, you know, kids are having kids, you know, like, you know, 17 year olds and 18 year olds are having kids and, 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 and this type of thing that it's, it's never, we'll, we'll get to questions at, at the end, but make a note. Uh, and then um, the other one thing I wanted to, to say, and then we can open it up for, for questions and, and, and conversation is he said, quote, above all, a place must be created in public opinion for the discussion of the problems of sexual life. It will have to become possible to talk about these things without being stamped as a troublemaker or as a person who makes capital out of the lower instincts. And so here too, there is enough work left to do for the next hundred years in which our civilization will have to learn to come to terms with the claims of our sexuality, end quote. That is such a good quote. That is such a good quote. <laughs> that it like that is exactly so timely. So I, I mean, let's talk about it. Yes. So yeah, I, I agree. I, yeah, you want to say? Okay. So I was I was also reading this same same quote to my spouse yes. earlier today. Great. So the the thing I want to add about this materialism that we talked about that I had some objections to was you know we should control all procreation of children and so on and so forth. What the, what the nuance here that I didn't hear you say was basically that this, there is a national need to have uh, for sex right at, to procreate whatever. But then he says that basically uh, because there is everything that causes satisfaction is uh, a hindrance. And everything that uh, hinders occurrence of satisfaction is harmful. Yeah. Okay. So this means that we have to bend the energies towards results that makes drastic changes and that towards rewarding results. And that would have drastic changes in, in our social conditions. So I think that was the interesting thing. So he's not, he's like, he's in one way agreeing with this uh, uh, controlling childbirth thing, but on another level, being realistic about how our biology sort of works on a sexual level and, and, and also trying to direct these energies in a like constructive rewarding way. And this is like the challenge, right? For for the next hundred years, which I have already happened by the way. But so yeah. Yeah, well I don't think I don't think we took the reason why I wanted to emphasize that last quote is because I think we didn't do that. Like we we absolutely failed that. And, and, but at the same time, I think here we're dealing with return of the repressed. Because we didn't do that, we are paying the penalty. We're paying, we're paying the penalty of not doing that. And I even want to propose the idea that not only is this not happening in institutions, you know, like my claim is that we don't get sexual education, like not actually, we don't get sexual education. Um, what I want to claim is that 
this public place, this public space where we can discuss problems of sexual life. I think you see this happening on YouTube. I think you see that, I think you see this happening on Reddit. I think you see this happening on online forums. You know, like if like the incel wiki, the incel community, you see this happening in online forums where people are taking it upon themselves to bring all these problems to the surface. So it, it's, yeah. it, it, it can't happen in the institutions. It has to be, it has to come from our own, like, look at me, I'm not in an institution. I, I'm like, I actually started, when I started talking about Freud, I was, I was, my, 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 all the professors at the institution didn't want to hear it. I, so I, I had to start an online course to talk about it. So that's how, that's how deep this goes. But isn't that the, the thing that um, I read about, uh, you know, Paul Verhaag, he talks about the, the sexual revolutions of like the uh, 68 and stuff like this. But we this, completely, this yeah, 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 we completely handled it wrong. But, totally. <laughs> and that's, wait, wait here, St sex positive. <laughs> we want sex <laughs> negative now. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. No, but that's the, yeah, it's, yeah, it's crazy that, you know, I, I am 20 years old, so I've been brought up in this, you know, sexual education uh, way of life, which was like completely atheistic and scientific and depersonalized, um, which is, I don't know, isn't, couldn't we make the argument to be very pessimistic that it's somewhat necessary for this to be repressed and that even though Freud wrote about this more than a hundred years ago, it's just that society as a whole, we can't handle this or, I don't know, yeah, nobody has the answer, I think, but I think, why we shoot I, at I, think this I think the answer lies in that he's saying that the necessary precondition for this is a true, truthful subjects and mature professionals, and we have neither. We, we have we have neither. So he's basically, I think what Freud's doing is he's underestimating the level, even though he's saying this is a huge problem, I think he's even underestimating the level of the problem himself. Because, because like, it's, it's almost, I would make a comparison with Freud and Marx here. Because I think Marx also underestimates the degree to the, of the problem. And I think Freud also is underestimating. So the, the basic lesson of this 21st century reading is things get worse, you know? <laughs> no. Well, maybe something that might be of relevance here is the fact that, well, what's missing about this framework? Superego, he doesn't talk about superego in here, but maybe later on it's, it's it, his, his ideas get a bit refined or revised when this becomes relevant. Um, I think that in the previous paper, he, he, he was sort of poking at it uh, by saying that obsessional ideas have this function of a reproach that is addressed to the self. But, but it's really missing. I, I think that the, the, the kind of, well, it's really funny that, uh, you know, the textbook objection to Freud in psychology today, in the psychology that calls itself kind of scientific or an objective. Well, the objection goes like this. Maybe sexuality was relevant then for to discuss since it was repressed for them. Exactly. It was the higher class, higher class Viennese bourgeois. But nowadays we know that, you know, yeah. but yeah. So that's the idea Alenka, is that- that's how, that's how Alenka Zupantrit starts, what is sex? Yeah, that's with that's this, that's this. The, 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 this is this. I uh, I was just discussing it with 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 a friend of mine who is uh, doing a PhD PhD in psychology, and, and he was <laughs> saying that oh, oh sex might have been a, a, a issue issue back then, but it's now now that we are free. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> it's crazy though. But what what do you think your friend would say if you? If you came back, so like what I'm claiming is that what Freud's saying we should do institutionally, I'm saying it's just happening naturally online. 
like with YouTube, Reddit or whatever, um, like what would your friend, what do you think your psychologist friend would say if you said, but look at all of these online communities who are making their sexual problems a number one identity issue or, you know, like look at the, these, these disruptions. Do you think that it would, it would, it would have any effect? I mean, I guess we're talking here to, I mean, we're talking to the process of substitution here. So no, it wouldn't. Yeah, it's difficult to say, but yeah. Well, the idea is that today we can, we can deal with it. And it's, 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 it's hard to say whether we are really closer or not to dealing with it. But I think that there is, there is in a way an ironical twist, which needs to be explained with reference to superego later on. Since I can, I agree with your idea here that superego is is missing in early Freud, and let's let's let, we, the the one we, the interesting thing about doing these readings progressively is that we can see how the system emerges, which is I I love doing this. I I will get to a, a, a more relevant point, but I love doing this studying the origin of uh, different fields of study, like studying the original thinkers in the field to see how the ideas actually emerge and grow because then you can learn how to actually develop new knowledge. I feel like that's the, that's the crucial um, thing to learn. But, um, oh, now I even, I, I, lost, I, lost, I lost my train. Oh yeah, my, here's what I wanted to say is on this idea of the psychology institutions saying sex is not really that big of a deal. In the intellectual circles I've been running around with lately, there's a connection to John Verveke and um, John Verveke is the psychology professor, cognitive scientist at University of Toronto, who's leading courses on the, uh, basically the meaning crisis, he calls it. And what I've learned from talking to a few people in this circle about John Verveke is that he claims that precisely with this psych psychological mantra, which sexuality is not that important, uh, we shouldn't talk about it that much. I don't want to disclose too much about my own personal life and so forth. So, and and he's doing a, a lecture series on the meaning crisis. Like, well, maybe, you know, <laughs> these ideas are not so irrelevant. <laughs> it's a, it's crazy. Well, there's that blockade again that we discussed. There's the blockade. There's a blockade. Really, like, I mean, I, I honestly don't know if you, if, if, if as a psychologist, you re meta reflectively watch your mind for 72 hours uh, a week, I'm not asking for too much. You are a psychologist. <laughs> Just watch your mind for a week or something. How can you not think that sexuality is important? It, it's it's because it's, you are a psychologist <laughs> like i can come to that conclusion very very quickly <laughs> it's so crazy right so crazy yeah i think that's a big thing right the the, the psychologists really want to occupy the position of the subject supposed to know they really uh, exactly. get off on that Exactly. And I just finished watching a, a debate between John Verveke and Jonathan Pajot. Uh, it was recently released on Rebel Wisdom. I don't know if you guys know Jonathan Pajot, but he's a contemporary Christian thinker. And Pajot's making the argument that the psychologist who pretends to know is the problem because it's this level of arrogance. Like, like the psychologist who pretends to know, who can like, for example, he gives the example of Ken Wilber as someone who thinks that they can occupy a position where they can by themselves deconstruct and reconstruct religion from their own ego. Like instead, like whereas Jonathan Pajot is basically saying that I assume that I have more to learn from religion than my ego could critique religion in some in some sense. So, Daniel, you wanted to say something? No, I, I, I think that's a very good point he's making there. And I think it's it relates not only to Christianity, but like all how West relates to basically all religions, really, right? Sure. 
I think that there is mainly a Hegelian issue here going on, since uh, when we think about the psychologists, well, well we, we, we should probably also see them with some sympathy since they might have families to support, they might have prospects about career and so on. They, they build their whole life on the life community, the Christ or the spirit that they, they, they are embedded in, the, the kind of community where they discuss and where they live, they cannot leave it that easily. And when we are discussing these issues, we are really on a, on a, on a dangerous terrain. It's, 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 it was a, a big struggle, I, I suppose, for psychoanalysis to become an institution which has a place in a society where somebody can practice it. And it's, it's really a story which, which needs to be told. And we and we already know we already know from Lacan that the whole process of psychoanalysis becoming an institution was a relative disaster from yeah. the perspective from the perspective of deep theory. Well, there and is the kind of kind of a problem or contradiction since well the level of revelation that comes from being really logical about these theories it's 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 even even in a Marxian sense kind of subversive and it, it, it might amount to some kind of transformation of societal structures, but we are also creatures who need the structure that supports our lives. It's a real Absolutely. contradiction in, in life. I mean, a Hegelian issue. Yes, yes. And, and now, like reading these passages in particular and, and these papers in particular, it makes so much sense to me that there's a link between Freudian Marxism, like that the, 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 necessity of, the necessity of interpreting psychoanalysis not as some bourgeois individualistic activity, but actually is already in the origin a communal tribal activity, if it is to have its real power. This is my this is this is my this is my claim here is that the more the more social we make this method, the more powerful I would imagine. Precisely because of the things you're bringing up about the how our, how we should have sympathy for the institutional psychologist making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year potentially. By the way, <laughs> but... that's, Carl, that's so good that you said this. Like the uh, the like the Marxism and psychoanalysis because. This has been the issue for Marxism as well. Look at Stalinism, you know, it was also a complete <laughs> disaster. Absolutely. And same with psychoanalysis. And also with yeah. the fact that, you know, both psychoanalysis and Marxism, I don't know, have to kind of be, I would say, a priori repressed in the society we live in right now, like the, you know, classes and stuff like this. So, well, I can, I can tell you that. I was like, I was a good academic subject for years. Like I was, I was top, top of my class, going through the motions, making the networks with the professors, building the career. And I read voraciously, but Marxism and Freudianism were not discussed. I didn't, I had to go, I had to, I had to abandon and forsake my institutional alliances to go deep into that. Oh yeah, and also just to uh, one other thing is that both psychoanalysis and Marxism are also theories about its resistance to it, which is a very interesting thing. You know, psychoanalysis. We are talking about the psychologists, you know, who are resisting psychoanalysis and encapsulating that in the theory of psychoanalysis. And also, Marxism is like you are bourgeois, you know. So there's this, yeah, kind of sameness in it for them. Well, the way I have formulated this for myself is that the way that uh, Marxism relates to political economy is the way that psychoanalysis relates to the university psychology, which calls itself scientific. So there's a common approach, but different objects, maybe. I just, I just, if you guys will give me a short moment. There's a line from Elenka Zupantric, What is Sex, where she, she makes a great observation on the link between 
psychoanalysis and Marxism. So I have the quote here. This is from What is Sex? <clears throat> it's about the shared objectivity of psychoanalysis and Marxism. She says, the objectivity is linked here to the very capacity of being partial or partisan. As Althusser puts it, when dealing with a conflictual reality, which is the case for both, both Marxism and psychoanalysis, one cannot see everything from everywhere. Some positions dissimulate this conflict and others reveal it. One can thus discover the essence of this conflictual reality only by occupying certain positions and not others in this very conflict. What this book aims to show and argue is that sex or the sexual is precisely such a position or point of view in psychoanalysis, not because of its dirty or controversial contents, but because of the singular form of contradiction that it forces us to see, to think, and to engage with, end quote. But there's this, there's this basic idea that this link between psychoanalysis and Marxism is that you're involved in the very conflict itself. Whereas in other forms of knowledge, you can have like an objective distance. Like, for example, Einstein isn't involved in a subjective conflict with general relativity. Like, it, it's, he can get objective view, view of whatever, or Dar same with Darwin and natural selection. It's not really the same sort of involvement of the subject. I have something to say about Darwin, by the way. I'm I think you know more about Darwin perhaps than I do, but like interesting thing though is that, I mean, the, the consensus about Darwin, isn't it Wallace that is basically the consensus of Darwin today, that like Darwin wrote this like sexuality and man or something like this, and this is not really textbooks, textbook evolution thing, right? So even if that's, I, I've heard like, but by all this argue this at least, so like maybe even, I think this is like how is it, that's basically what you're saying, like how a student works, is that they abstract the, away the, the real, or whatever, the dangerous things. Absolutely. And, and, and only talk about the, the, the non-threatening things to this too. They kind of stay in imaginary semblances. <laughs> yeah, it could be, like, I, I would love to have a conversation with Darwin, you know, like, I, I would, I would, I would love to sit down with Darwin and 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 hash it out. Because, look, like that that guy probably was he probably knew so much that he didn't put it in books. Like I, I would like to have conversation <laughs> with Darwin because he was sitting on those books for decades. Like he he knew he was going to rupture things. <laughs> you know so. Yeah, and he he did make a point in I can say for example on the origin of species. He made a point not to put humans in on the origin of species. He he saves that for the later book, The Origin of Man or whatever. Yeah. So um, is there anything else uh, anyone wants to say? Otherwise we can we can we can wrap we can wrap up for this this session. What any, anyone feeling anything from these three papers they wanna 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 add or or some final final thoughts on they take from this i i can just i can just say that for for me i think what i take away from these readings is not just the common what we all know about freud that he sexes the the cause and we have neurotic symptoms as a result of our sexual life and that the traumas in the origin and um you know the method of psychoanalysis to go to that but but also this very interesting comments about the social inscription, interesting comments about the, you know, the, <clears throat> the, the, the way in which we need to approach sexuality from a, a type of different form of ethics. Um, it requires a type, in order for it to become sort of a, legitimate form of knowledge it's almost like we already have to be the overman you know like that's the connection with Nietzsche for me is like in order for psychoanalysis to work it's like we already have to be overmen but then this method is supposed to help us become overmen so how do we become overmen and use the method it's like it's like chicken and the egg problem so um but what I take away uh, that I really appreciate for my own personal life is um the braveness to be with the truth, to work with the truth, and that takes courage. 
And then also as on the other side of like in a professional context, um, to be a very mature and responsible therapist, that, that these two elements are really important. And then also for me thinking in a personal and professional way, thinking outside of our normal um, individualistic way and in a more communal way. Uh, and that's what I've been doing with like the online men's circles. I think that the principle of the, whether it could be men's circle, women's circle, any type of circle you like, uh, this principle of free association works well. It, it works well. And, 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 and let's, and, and I, I just would challenge, challenge you all. Like, can we think, can we think collective method? Because psychoanalysis is de defined as a method which works very individualistically. Can we, can we think collective method? This well, is- uh, Sorry, but I might just add just one, one more to the collection of the boring classic objections to Freud is this one, one which comes mostly from psychiatrists which says that Freud's observations may have been uh, accurate in his own clinical practice, but when he ventures into social life, when he starts to generalize from his practice, that's when he's no longer scientific or that's when he, he's going astray. This is the objection by, by some, some even prominent uh, psychiatrists who, who have practiced Freud, I wouldn't say it's a Freudian psychoanalysis, but some kind of psychoanalysis themselves also. So they want to, I, I don't get it. How, how can they be so arrogant that they think that they can restrict their, their observations about human, human beings into some kind of isolated place and not, not generalize? How can we not generalize over the social? I, I, think, and, we, I think we should be more messy and I'm, I'm totally yeah. open I'm totally open to the idea that we need to invent new method. I'm not saying let's just stay exactly with the Freudian method. I'm saying, like, I think it's useful because I'm I'm actually using it, and and I think it's useful. Like, I'm 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 making in in the physical online groups. Uh, sorry, not the online, the physical groups I'm working with. The level of advance in the emotional idea of their sexuality is enormous. In just a few weeks. But the problem still, I, I don't have methods for the types of problems these men are telling me. I don't have any answers for them. I don't, and, or I don't have it better than answers. I don't have any tool or method to help them deal with the problems that emerge. And so this is to me what I'm trying to think. So um, yeah, I, I mean, I, and so then I just have sympathy with this Freudo-Marxist uh, theoretical link. Um, but lots of more discussions to come. So um, these videos will be released. I mean, these workshops will do them again. I'll 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 put a notice up for uh, next next Saturday, two weeks from now. Um, and thank you guys so much for your contributions. Thank you so much for being here. This makes my day, uh, and and I really appreciate it. So and I hope it I hope it helped you. And let's let's keep going. If if you guys wanna wanna keep going, all right. Thank you guys. Thing. I'm sorry for interrupting uh, on the last comment, but yeah. I, I forgive you. <laughs> well, 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 for your methods, let's remember to apologize, be gentle and so on. Good manners, <laughs> just, like she, just like she says, you know. Fuck you. <laughs>